all of us. Um, so I'm going to start by just showing you a few, uh, trying to explain to you who Beppo was. Um, I think we sometimes forget that she was a human being, um, and because she's like this mythical figure, um, which she continues to be, of course. And, um, and then we'll show you a film, and, uh, and then we'll go from there, okay? So I'm going to just move over here, right away. Downward. So, I think you guys recognize this map, right? Um, I just, I just, just, it's just for some, you know, so you guys, I know you guys know where Honduras is for the most part, but I, I wanted to show you this because this is, this is the route. This is a route. You know from, from where, from Honduras, from Central America to the U.S., right? There are many ways to take this route. I'm sure you guys have all heard this, seen the stories, seen the, the films. This route is 3,000 miles long. What happened to Berta and what happens to people in Honduras at this point in time and for the last, since the coup, is that because of what is happening in Honduras, people leave Honduras and Central America and make this dangerous journey to the United States. Now, they don't have the resources we have, and that's why they're coming up here. And they don't care what it takes to come up here, they have to feed their children. So I just want to make sure you guys understood that this all does have a relevance to our current political climate. It has everything to do with immigration, with refugees, with DACA, with a lot of you directly as well. Okay. Sorry, I'm not talking down to you. I'm just... <laughs> <clears throat> this young lady um, is Berta. She was a little girl, just like all of you, some of you, I guess. <laughs> this is a picture on the back. I wish I had a, um, a photo of the picture of what's on the back. It's an inscription, you know, written by Betita, by her. It, obviously she didn't. My grandmother wrote it. And it was a photo that was sent to me when uh, I was born from Batita. We were two years apart. She's, I think she's about three in this picture, so I had just been born. We were two years apart, excuse me. So she was really like a, 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 a not really an older sister, but like a sister to me whenever I would go to Honduras. And we would, we would play, you know, like you do when you have children. Um, and that's her little black doll that one of her sisters actually stole from her and burned. <laughs> she was a beauty queen in, 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 in at primary school. This, this, this was her world. And these are her children, and Berta. Remember these faces. She was, uh, so her mother was a midwife in a small town called La Esperanza, which means the hope. Mama Berta, as we call her, and as many people know her in, in La Esperanza, uh, provided medical care many times free to indigenous people in the region. And Berta was there. I, I mean, when I would go, I would go maybe two weeks or a month or maybe just a week during the summer. And I would hang out, you know, and I would get up and I would hear this murmur. That murmur was people lined up in benches in the hallway in my grandmother's house waiting to be seen by her. It was about six o'clock in the morning. They were all indigenous people, they were all impoverished. They had nowhere else to go for medical care. And Petita was there helping her every day, seven days a week. And this is what Perto, Petita was surrounded by, watching her mother provide medical care, sometimes successfully, sometimes very unsuccessfully. I saw one, the one time, the uh, image I'll never forget, was a little, a little tiny boy who was supposedly five years old who died from diarrhea. 
who dies from diarrhea. Is that possible? It is. All my grandmother could do was light candles and put the boy's body on a suitcase on top of a dresser so the mother could sit there and cry. That was Petita's world, day in and day out. I need my paper because I'm going to read one, one quick thing. This is, this is the first op-ed uh, I was able to write for the New York Times a few days after she was killed. Um, and I'm just going to read you a short section of it. During my vi frequent visits as a child to Honduras and our large extended family, Bertita and I, she was only two years my elder, would chase each other and our cousins around the garden playing hide-and-go-seek or play soccer in the dirt patches always being careful not to crush my grandmother's red roses. In July 2009, I went to Honduras as a producer for an international news network. It was a day after a coup by the Honduran military. Business elites and right-wing political opposition removed the democratically elected President Manuel Zelaya from office. Army troops whisked him away to Costa Rica in his pajamas. Pertita had been working with indigenous groups on education and rights issue with Mel Zelaya's support. She was already well known throughout the country and by international rights organizations in the region. Her opposition to the coup catapulted her into global recognition. On our first night in Tegucigalpa in the Honduran capital, I decided to profile her, but she warned me, we need to go to a safe house. Come with us and we'll talk there. We set out in a taxi, one of her cell phones rang, and after a quick conversation with another organizer, she said, we need to switch taxis and someone will pick us up. This had become her life in Honduras. There were no roses to worry about now. It changed. You know, that was the first time I had seen Gatita in probably 10, 15 years. From, you know, worrying about my grandmother's roses to worrying about her life. This is how she lived since the coup. And this is why it's so important that we stand up for her now and for Honduras. Now I'm gonna, we're going to show the film and then we'll show a second film and I'll explain in between why the second one. Thanks. Um, children of Beth, as I showed you before, this is Nara who you saw Olivia, who's now a um, uh, legislator in the Honduran Congress. Uh, Salvador, who's, who's uh, in medical school in Argentina. Uh, Laura is also studying in Argentina. And the reason these two are studying in Argentina is because of the threats to Beth's life. Like, of course, the, the police could have, or someone could have threatened her children, so she had to send them away to school. And it's not like Beth is wealthy. Beth didn't. Those were, those were scholarships given to her kids to keep them alive. And this is, this is Bertita. Bertita's, this article is really good. Um, it's the New York Times in Spanish, it's not translated into English. But it, it talks about the, those who inherited Bertita's role. And you saw Bertita, and if you've ever seen them speak, any one of these guys, they're really incredible. Um, I can't, I can't come anywhere near to, to how well they speak, and of course you know why. Um, I'm going to give you a, a quick update, and then we'll, we're going to start with Roxana, who's, who's going to talk to us about the importance of the news of today, what happened today, and she'll explain why. Uh, so it's been two years since her murder, there are now nine men being held. Uh, it was eight as of yesterday. Um, the CEO of DESA, the company that owns the dam, um, which is owned by one of the wealthiest families in Central America, um, has been arrested. The next court date is in June, um, and 
the Honduran government has refused the uh, uh, Ministerio Público, which is essentially the uh, prosecutorial arm of the Honduran government, has refused to hand over all of the evidence. Which, by law, they're required to do. And Rosanna's going to explain some of that in a second. The Kaipa Report is a group of independent lawyers who looked at the evidence that was given to the prosecution by the government. It's about this much evidence compared to this much that the government has and that refused, they refuse to hand over. Sure. Bueno, vamos a empezar con. Um, so, Berta didn't die. <laughs> Berta no murió. Se multiplicó. All right, thank you. Because that's how they started every meeting in Honduras. Every meeting I went to with a call and response to honor Berta and to honor the, the fight that they were involved with. So, um, I'm a professor at the law school here at UC Berkeley, I'm a human rights attorney. And in um, November of 2016, I was asked to join a team of independent um, experts to uh, investigate the murder of Beth Alcaceres. Um, there's uh, five of us. Um, there's two of us who are US nationals, um, two Colombians, and one Guatemalan. And all of us had extensive experience um, in international human rights investigations. Uh, several were former prosecutors, including um, the Guatemalan who's the former prosecutor for the um, Rio Small case in Guatemala. Um, so I'm just going to quickly, like in five minutes, yeah, uh, give a, an overview of, um, of our investigation. So as um, Silvio was explaining, um, you know, we did all the regular things you would expect from an investigation. We visited Honduras several times. We interviewed um, witnesses. We um, collected uh, documentation related to the case. We reviewed about 10 criminal proceedings related to the case, um, including um, the murder of the cocaine activist that was mentioned, um, the 2013 murder by the military. Um, and then um, towards the end of our investigation in, in July of, um, of 2017, um, we were given 55 gigs of telephone data. Um, and what I mean by 55 gigs of telephone data is we were given about, um, I think it was like uh, 10,000 pages of uh, cell phone call logs. So for about three dozen numbers, we had uh, who they called uh, for a period of three months and the GPS location of the caller and uh, the person receiving the call. And then for four telephones, we had extractions, which means um, you can think about all the information you have on your cell phone, your emails, your photos, your audios, your WhatsApp chats. In Latin America, people use WhatsApp often. Your texts. Um, everything you have on your cell phone, we have the extractions um, for. Um, and of the four phones, one was for Sergio Rodriguez, the head of environmental affairs for the company. One was for, um, and I can say his name now, although it's not in the report, David Castillo, who is the CEO of the company. He was arrested today. So if you... One is for the CFO of the company, who hopefully will be arrested soon. And the other was uh, Lourdes Bustillo, who is the former head of security for the company. What you, what you heard in these films, these films were made before our investigation. So when you see the radio station in the first film, we found WhatsApp chats between groups of people working for the company, um, executives in the company, their public relations team, their security team, where they're discussing sabotaging the radio station, uh, Rio Blanco's radio station in, in Tejera. And they actually sabotage it, they put a, a, an interference satellite to block the signal. Um, 
when you hear Victor Fernandez talking about the system of control that the company was um, using to monitor Berta's movements, we found in the text messages that they had paid informants following Berta in every community. Um, they're discussing the salaries for these informants and they're discussing the information that they're given and the network of informants. In the text messages, they talk about that guy in the most uh, violent language you can imagine. When they talk about her being um, so that at one point in one of the films, I think it was the first one they talked about in 2013, that there was a criminal um, action against uh, Copin leadership. So Berta, Tomás Garcia, and... ¿Cuál es el tercero? No estoy... Berta, Gustavo, no. Gaspar, no. Okay, there was a third one, and for some reason I'm blanking. So there was... Actually, and so you have Navi, uh, you actually have the CFO of the company, who's one of the most from one of the most powerful families in Honduras and in Central America, saying, "I have spent a lot of political capital and money on those arrest warrants." So they co-opted the actual judiciary, put the judiciary at the service of the company to let them protect their economic interests. In the movie, when you see um, in Bajo Aguan, when they describe what's happening in Bajo Aguan with the company Vinant in, in Bajo Aguan uh, getting military support um, for security, and that was happening um, also in Aguasarca, the dam project in, in that, that, that was opposing. So we had found a number of text messages where the company is in contact with the Ministry of Security, with local police stations, with local military units, and they're discussing joint training, joint operations, and they're discussing also the company is giving instructions to the police and the military about how they should neutralize opposition by Gopin. So they're actually putting the military and the police at the service of the company. And that's reflected in, in the text messages also. Um, I also wanted to, so you can, in the report, read for yourself the words of, of these individuals. And, and, and um, that was really important to us that people could form their own opinions. And what you will see if you read the text is the amount of racism that is prevalent in these texts. They dehumanize these communities. Um, they uh, refer to them in racist terms because of their indigenous ancestry. Um, and they use that as a way to treat them as less than human and justify their actions. From their perspective, they were bringing progress and development to the community, and they were subversive rebels um, um, obstructing that, that progress. So, David Castillo, who was arrested today, and then I'll end there. So he is the CEO of the company. He's one of the intellectual authors, and you can, if you look at the report we issued, he's executive one or directivo one. That, that's, um, and he is, cited extensively in the report because he was the most bloodthirsty of the executives. So I think it's important to bear in mind that this company received international financing from FinFund, um, a Finnish development bank, from FML, a Dutch development bank. They were being considered for financing from the World Bank, the IFC, the International Financial Corporation, and they, have, they continue to have financing from the Central American Bank of Economic Integration. So the company now has two individuals um, um, uh, indicted for the murder of Berta Casares. And this is what um, that money, taxpayer money, is going towards. 
It was, it makes in the logic, this neoliberal logic of economic development, it makes absolute sense that Bertha, Bertha was going to die. They, they started DESA with $1,200 in capital. And they were given a 50-year concession for the Rio Huarque. So think about it. They could pay off the loan within five to six years. And for the other 44 years, it was almost pure profit. It made sense in that neoliberal logic to kill Berta and many of the others. We found that actually documented 135 incidents of threat and violence against Copin. There, we should all model, we should take Copin as an example. They have shown such tremendous, tremendous courage and tenacity in this fight, as well as Silvio and the Casares family. So it's a real pleasure to be here. I told Silvio earlier today it would have felt, felt wrong to do anything else than to be here tonight. I'm so happy you included me in this event and that you included me in the, in, in the lucha, you know, to honor Bertha Cáceres. Thank you. It's on um, it's on bertacaceres.org. It's also on um, gaipe.net. G a i p e dot net. It's in Spanish and English now, um, and I will put up a page where I have useful links. Uh, and well, yeah. So on this page at the bottom, you have to. Oh, there it is. Go, can you go back to the home page? So on the home page, it's all the way at the bottom. So you have to just scroll all the way down. Sorry, that's a little clearly a lot of news. Um, and I, I, I guess I just, now well, I think we should probably take a few questions if you guys are okay with that and find out what you guys want to know most about. I don't know if there's a microphone for you guys, but you might have to shout. <coughs> yes. um, I'm glad that you were here. Very, very happy. I think uh, Honduras is really beautiful. And unfortunately, all the land uh, is not appreciated in many ways. Uh, do you know that we are in war in Honduras? This is not anymore about Berta. This is about the Lencas. It's, it's totality in all the poor people. Um, you have 182 countries who did not support when Celaya was taken out and they were punished with that economy. Are you in contact with the new activities in terms of, of uh, sending a commission and visit all these countries? Because, you know, in terms of wars, Honduras is not there. Yeah. It's not in comparison with El Salvador, that we had a war for, 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 since 1935. Uh, in Nicaragua, with samosas, and all those things, you know. Now, this is a war. This is not anymore about, you know, one Berta and one, you know, this is, this is, this is beyond to save the country. Uh, and the 182 countries are there, and it means money for people to go out there. I think that um, um, I, um, I was impressed by her eloquence. She was very eloquent and very strong and very powerful with what she was saying and she was believing. And I saw the last uh, uh, interview that she had when she was, uh, the, she was talking about the uh, Secretary of State of the United States visiting, which was That's supposedly a, that was the time where the, the commission was landed that she needs to be yeah. killed. That's a, I mean, that's a very good point. This, we also have to remember that this, this didn't just happen. This happened, in, this started in 2009. This started before FDR. I mean, this has been U.S. policy in Honduras. And since the coup in 2009, it's only accelerated. And now who was in office in 2009? Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. 
I was in Honduras. So the I mean, day that they took Celaya out. Yeah. I was in the airport and they was full of helicopters, right? Yeah, they, they, no, they, it was they, crazy. I, mean, I, mean, was I didn't know what was going on. So there I mean he obviously this is a very good point that we need to make is that it's not just Trump. You know, it's not Rex Tillerson. It's not just the current people in the US Embassy in Honduras or the State Department. This is US policy for many, many decades. Um, and one more thing I want to add, since you brought this up, is that if you notice something, Honduras is the second poorest country in Latin America. It switches between Haiti, I don't know, between Nicaragua and Honduras. Where else is this happening? These things are happening in the poor communities in poor countries. The indigenous community in, in North Dakota, the pipeline, it's happening there. It's happening in Africa. It's happening in Bangladesh. It's happening in, in Myanmar. I've done, I've worked in stories in Myanmar where they're raping the land. Now, this is something we need to keep in mind because we're the ones profiting off of this here. So we need to stand up for these poor communities who don't have representation. And that's what Betha was doing. So yeah, Betha, Betha it's not just about Betha. I mean, this is about all the Bethas. This is about people all over the world. You know, and this is why organizations like the Goldman Foundation, Goldman Environmental Prize, recognizes people in places like Cambodia, Africa, Ukraine. This is not one single thing happening in one small place. Do we have more questions? Uh, what's your opinion on Investigation 
they had, we had 55 gigs of information. The public ministry has been sitting in on a couple teras of information for two years. When we met with the public ministry after we issued our report, the head prosecutor didn't know the investigation. So David Castillo's extraction report is 15,000 pages long. They had only read a half of one of the extraction reports, Sergio Rodriguez's. They hadn't even looked at David Castillo's. It's not just David Castillo. Um, oh, and the day before we, we launched our report, we received a cease and desist letter from the Adela family, which was really interesting and kind of fortuitous in a way. The Atala family in our report. We didn't mention any unindicted suspects. So we met with the G16 when we first arrived in Honduras, and we met with the G16 again when we left after we issued our report. So I provided the G16 with a copy of that cease and desist letter so that the G16 could see the kind of tactics that this family uses in order to ensure that people feel intimidated and, and scared to, at least that's my interpretation, scared to speak truth. So I'm hoping, I don't know how you go after David Castillo without going, the CEO, without going after the CFO, who is a member of a certain family, because they're in constant communication in all the data. So I got my fingers crossed that we're gonna see another arrest warrant soon. Um, today, if you look at Copin's report on their on their website, which is the most important communications that they give out, at the end of it, um, they specifically claim the Atala family. But I think when you bring up these large landowning families, you start to question Central America's political landscape, where this kind of neo-colonial state, um, where and whether it's 10 or 12 families, are truly in control of this political power. And I think that's why Berta Cáceres, you know, when you start attacking a certain project, financed by certain political ties, and then that tends to revolve around this political family apparatus, they become a threat. I mean, Berta Cáceres was supporting Rio Blanco. What was Rio Blanco attacking? The Fabuse family. And then when you start realizing that, you know, this woman, right, an indigenous woman, challenging this new colonial government that assumes, as the professor has confirmed, you know, through these texts, that dehumanizing comments that these folks are incapable of realizing the true scope of this nature of the government. Why we're Honduras, the Partido Nacional in particular is somehow vinculated or supporting the interests of these landowners who then try to enforce and this repression upon the indigenous community. So Berta since 2009, I mean in 2011 from the report Copin managed to sign an agreement with ex-president Porfirio Lobo Sosa, you know, on the commitment not to authorize the construction of dams in Lengo communities if informed, and there has to be some form of informed consultancy. So, I mean, when we think of Copin attacking these large landowning families or somehow having an impact in incriminating them, they have institutional support supporting them and their cause and ultimately, hopefully results in more arrests because, I mean, the political ties make it very, very difficult, especially in the current state of Honduras with an, an, an unofficial government, unofficial government um, with one of them going on this. And, and sorry, he's, he's right. You know, when you just mentioned Pepe Lillo, who was a former president, he was the one that was put in office right after the coup. Pepe Lobo's wife has now been indicted on corruption charges. His son? And his son has also been. Juan, the current president's brother, has been, had to testify to the DEA here because he's got ties to um, drug trafficking, as does Julian Pacheco, who is, uh, who is he? security yeah. minister? Minister security. Yeah, security minister, it's interior minister. I mean, it's, it's a mafia. The Geico report. Yeah, so we, we released the report in, in November and we got, I would call it, how would you describe the news coverage that we got? Not good enough. <laughs> but, but good. It was, pretty, it, was, it was strong. Um, I think part of the challenge is um, 
keeping attention on these issues. You know, in my experience, you have such a high profile um, political assassination like Berta Cáceres. The case doesn't last a year or two years, it lasts 15 to 20. I mean, I worked extensively in Colombia and Guatemala. I litigated, you know, cases of forced disappearance from Guatemala that are from the 80s. And the families are still insisting on justice. And don't take that as depressing. It is that our country's institutions don't work the way they should, but think about the resolve of those family members and the organizations that support them. It's extraordinary. It's absolutely extraordinary. And don't think for one minute that they are motivated by vengeance or hate. It is pure love. I've had many clients that 35 years later are still making lunch every day for their disappeared son. So I, I, I mean, so we try to make sure that our report, you can find it on the website, you can also find it on the law schools, the Human Rights Clinic's website. Um, and uh, members of our team continues to support the legal team. One difference between Latin America, thankfully, and the United States um, is that in Latin America, the family members can be represented by a private prosecutor in the criminal proceedings. And that's the only reason in Colombia, in Chile, in Argentina, in a lot of these countries, there's ever been human rights prosecutions. It's not because the state has wanted to prosecute. It's because you get a really stubborn lawyer to represent a very brave family member, and they won't let go of the bone. And they keep forcing the prosecution. And so my hope is that with this indictment, we'll see the domestic legal team move um, strongly to get additional indictments of connected individuals. And you can, you can see in the report, in the appendix, there are the WhatsApp messages, uh, a, a decent amount of them. Um, and they scoured them, and they, I mean, they did a pretty thorough investigation of this stuff that the MP already had, that the Ministerio Público already has, but hasn't done anything about it. More questions? Hi, uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm also from Uber. Uh, I'm sitting here at Al, and then I was wondering what is like the role of the regular kind of like Honduran person that is not identified, you know, like a, a Lenka or a Carisma, people who live like my family, and San Pedro Sula, and Carisma, who, you know, a lot of us end up using the same uh, racist language that you probably mm -hmm. find in the WhatsApp messages. People who, like my parents, and myself as well, that are everything we get information about Honduras is from like in Honduras is like from the Honduran media, which is also controlled. Um, you know what is our it's role in all of that? Yeah, exactly. I you know I was talking to my staff. I went to a lecture here, uh, a professor who worked in Honduras, and then they were explaining like the uh, different trends during the presidency of uh, Manuel Zelaya. And then in my head, I was just like, this is not what I knew from coming from Honduras. Because I came before the quake like in 2008, um, and it's the same thing with my family when I spoke to them. And then, you know, they say, my first is when I run away. <laughs> in, in their head. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that, to a certain <laughs> extent. <laughs> 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 I mean, that's... But <sighs> well, they wouldn't believe, like, you know, that like there could be some blood in, in his presidency, and in their head, he's yeah. like an enemy as well. And, this, and this, is the, this is one of the issues, that there is a vacuum. And, and, and these people who, these families, know that there's a vacuum. And that's, that's part of the reason, I mean, can you imagine if Bepta was alive today? He wouldn't have been reelected. He wouldn't have run. But there was no way that was going to happen. She, she was marked, you know? So this was, this, I mean, there's no, there's no options right now. And part of the reason is that there's a colossal vacuum in Honduras. There aren't good candidates. <coughs> Betta, I mean, Betta would have been it. Honestly, I mean, there are plenty of strong females who are fighting for their lives right now, like medium, you saw medium there. And Padre Melo is not a female, but he's, you know, he's an organizer. Um, but these, these people are, you know, there's, there's nowhere for Hondurans to go. And that's the problem. And that's what our policies here in the U.S. should be attempting to foment, to help Honduras educate young girls and young boys about their heroes, because there's so few in Honduras, and they need heroes, clearly. 
Now, about, you know, there's a lot of racist attitudes in all of Latin America. There's no way you can excuse that. I think part of it is a generational thing. I faced that with my parents. I, I you know, we had a cousin who was gay, and I remember having a conversation with my mother about this, and she's like, that's not natural. That was some 25 years ago. And now she loves him and loves his partner, you know? So, I mean, it's a constant conversation. That is another whole bunch of seminars, probably. But it's, it's man, it's, it's just parents are hard. <laughs> <laughs> Your so mother is lovely. I'm, I love my son's here, so oh. he's going <laughs> Have you done? Have you done? Have you I had the opportunity to meet Laura and Salva in Buenos Aires. If you're all studying right in Buenos Aires, then yeah, um, they're wonderful um, people. And think about this, the show that I'm looking for you, how many of the do you think that there are? You know? So when I asked you this question, like Laura, um, at first they were very skeptical. I mean, let me explain that to you. You know, I showed up to this meeting, um, I'm, I'm not advising them, and they're very, very skeptical of me because of the fear for their lives, right? I mean, I come here with the Honduras soccer jersey thinking that, you know, I'm cool, you know, I sense solidarity, but I have to really earn their trust and tell them, you know, kind of explain the work that we were doing here in the United States to let them know. And I kept asking her, like, what is going to make an impact? And she said, here, I know the Honduran population isn't as big in certain areas where we're coming from, but it's a matter of uniting all Central Americans, making them realize that this is an episode as it occurred in El Salvador, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Belize, Haiti. This is something that's happening in Latin America throughout the world, so how is it that we, as a nation of not even 9 million people, begin trying to expose this narrative to the rest of our communities here? And if anything, I remember Salah saying that, um, we sent him a video, there's July um, 2016, Corpin put out a asking us to release balloons in front of um, a location to kind of represent Berta. And it was about four of us, and we had some balloons, and you know, he was, he was laughing, but he was really, really happy to see that even though it was four of us in front of Sproul, we were out here trying to chant Berta's name. So I think that, especially as you all, you know, seeing Laura, Berta had to leave her mom, her master program, to take cargo the Copin. You know, Salva and Laura, because of Berta's fear, you know, for her two youngest children are studying to be doctors in Buenos Aires, still organizing Buenos Aires with amazing Argentines that are taking to the streets because they understand the history of disappearances, political repression. So I think as Hondureño, as a North American, North American, you know, as a Latinx community, we have the power, you know, in the U.S. taxpayer country, you know, to really have an impact on what happened with Copin and how the government tries to approach them. That's, that's a great point. Solidarity is, is what's key to Beta's work. And whether it's you know, South Dakota, North Dakota, the pipelines, or if it's you know, pipelines going through Texas, um, or Honduras, or wherever, this, we have to work together. And, and this is the only way we're going to be able to combat this. Whether it's social media, or you know, writing op-eds, writing your congressman, it, it just, while I'm on that point, I'm going to say one thing about um, HR 1299, which is the House Resolution Bill that we have that has Betta's name on it. It's the Betta Casas Human Rights and Honduras Act. This would deny security funding from the U.S. to the Honduran government. What's happening right now, or what's been happening since the election, is that the Honduran government has been using bullets that we bought for them on hundred citizens who are fighting for democracy. We need to really think about that. Is, is that the best use of our money? We need to change that paradigm. And we have to start with our own representatives. And we have to wake them up. I've had some really horrible conversations with some of these Democrats. I don't even bother with Republicans, but I would if they open the door. But honestly, it's, I mean, it's, it's our own, it's Democrats. They're many times the biggest obstacles sometimes. So we have to educate them. I've gone to the World Bank, sorry, I'll, I'll, I should ask you, call you in a second. I've been to the World Bank, and I've met with people, I was with Laura, and they had no clue what was happening in Honduras. Where the money the World Bank was giving to Honduras, the millions of dollars for projects, infrastructure projects. They had no idea 
what was happening and how the money was being used. They were shocked. It was a room full of wealthy Latin men who work at the World Bank, most of them ex presidents. I just wanted to ask what the resistance is or what makes these conversations with Democrats awful? Like what are you what are you finding? The answer I always I had been getting when I was in September was you know, I, I just mentioned the bill, right? I, I, and and that for that, this bill, it's $18 million. And their response is, I don't want to pull out of Honduras. Now, I never said pull out of Honduras. I said $18 million. Their response is, we can't pull out of Honduras. It's a, it's a game. It's just a game. And there are people who are Democrats, who are defending Juan Armando, right? Norma Torres, who's head of the Central American Caucus, she would bring Juan Armando to Capitol Hill. She's Guatemalan. She left at five. Why is she in Guatemala? Because of the violence. And now she's helping Juan Armando get money. Now she gotten a little upset and she's yelling at the State Department saying, why are you, you know, um, supporting Juan Armando? But she won't sign on to our bill. This is a California representative. We need to make sure we're heard. So that's, yeah, it's, you know, it's, like they always have that standard answer, we can't pull out of them do this. Can I, can I say one thing about that? I was at an event and I had a um, a, a, a Colombian woman who's now actually a judge on uh, Colombia's Human Rights Court with me. Um, I represented her for years because um, her father was, was killed in, in Colombia by the paramilitaries. And an audience member asked her, what can we do to help kind of the Colombian human rights situation and legal accountability? And she has spent the last three days at this conference in Dayton, Ohio, listening to um, Carol Anderson talk about segregation, Jim Grove South, um, talking about racism, talking about human rights issues we have in this country. And the way she answered that audience member, for me, was, was brilliant. She said, how can you ever expect your US foreign policy to be in any way just if there's so much injustice in your own country? Our policies in the rest of the world reflect the inequalities and the inequities that we have in our country. What's happening with Tigres and Fusina and all these military groups, what's happening in the prisons in Honduras, that reflects what's happening in our own country. So I think it's, it's absolutely, I'm an international human rights attorney, I think it's important to work on what's happening abroad, but in, as long as there's discrimination and oppression and repression in their own country, it, nothing will change abroad. One, one more. How big favor to ask. Um, so, we're students that are um, immigrant youth, they just came to use school from Honduras, and basically the same as um, our brother who asked, what is the role of the and Hondureño, Hondureña, Hondureño is normal. Same thing, if you can say something, what is the role of an advice in Spanish, we can say it. But there's just like immigrant youth from Honduras who are super interested to be here. We have one that wants to be a human rights lawyer, so I'm glad you're here. Yeah, oh, thank you for coming here. I think thank you very much. Um, obviously, I'll be seeing Papo, right? Now, it's good. <laughs> Hay unas organizaciones en área de la Bahía que pues, están promoviendo más como comunicaciones sobre lo que está pasando en Honduras. Así que podemos hablar nosotros si ustedes también quieren organizarse con hondureños, hondureños de todo tipo de generación. Eh, y lo que nosotros estamos haciendo es nos ponemos en San Francisco, en Oakland y tratamos de... Pues, especialmente la comunidad hondureña que es nacida de allá como ustedes que tienen un testimonio eh, muy como si se muy pesada no porque ustedes están explicando la realidad que han viviendo allá en Honduras porque muchas de la comunidad se han oído así que yo yo les invito a hacer yo les puedo dar información y 
así como nos podemos conectar y formar un grupo estudiantil, especialmente al nivel de la prepa, ¿no? Para tra de tratar de motivarlos a ustedes, ¿no? De tomar la responsable, ya que están aquí en los Estados Unidos y tienen unos poderes democráticos en alzar la voz y explicar sus preocupaciones, cómo que ustedes van a utilizar su presencia aquí para decir los congresionistas, ¿no? La realidad que le pasó a Berta Cáceres, la realidad que están viviendo nuestros primos y, por ejemplo, mi familia y mi papá, que todavía siguen el progreso de Honduras, en eh, o sea, este malo militar de Juan Orlando Hernández. Eh, no sé si... Y si quieren venir a la Facultad de Derecho, con mucho gusto, me encantaría recibirlos y darles un tour y hablarles de qué es estudiar Derecho. Y tengo estudiantes acá que también les interes interesaría hablar con ustedes. Mucho gusto, bienvenidos, bienvenidas. Sí. Y, y, ah, y a mí también, pueden venir a la casa. Tenemos unas copusas. La organización... La organización ha hecho un estudio ambiental del, 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 del proyecto. Mm, environmental impact. Del, 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 Did JASA do an environmental? The organization has made an Which environmental impact study about what is going to do the dam. So, um, um, for now, the dam is suspended. Um, so, there were environmental impact studies. Um, um, approved by the government. They were uh, lacking, um, but now the project is suspended. Um, I know that Cobain um, also has done its own independent studies of, of what they think um, the impact of the dam would have been. I think it's really important also, just very briefly, you heard um, free prior and informed consent mentioned in the, the companies use, they consulted with the communities. And they used that international obligation to infiltrate the communities. We actually have the PowerPoint presentations that the, co the, government, uh, the companies used. Um, and what they did is they just told the most positive story they could. They did never discuss what would be the risks, the harms, or the co maybe some of the adverse consequences of a dam. So that doesn't comply, obviously, with the duty to provide informed consultation. And then they use those, those, those meetings to implicitly threaten dissent. So they had all the leaders of the community stand up, voice their approval. They had their armed guards at the meetings. Um, and that obviously undermines any kind of voluntary um, consent. And they also forged signatures. So I'm just going to read one one final thing. So we got to all head out of here. This was um, this is an uh, an op-ed that uh, Bertita wrote um, and was put in the país today. I encourage you to read it. If you can read Spanish, I think it's much better in Spanish. Uh, but I have I'm going to read the English version. Just the, just the first two paragraphs, real quick. I was in Mexico two years ago when, in the early hours of the morning, I received a call confirming what you had warned us about so often, that one day they would kill you because of your struggle. At that moment, I knew that we had to take on the quest for justice with the same strength and determination as you would have done. What I did not know was how I would tackle such impunity. I, packed, I immediately packed my suitcase, called my brothers and sisters, and left for Honduras to share my suffering with that of the people who were always at your side, the members of the Civic Council of Indigenous and Popular Organizations of Honduras, your companions in arms. We need to join them. We need to lock arms with them. And with all the other struggles going on around the world, I put this going now. Thank you.